time to you, Jesus. We pray in your powerful, holy, and precious name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we're back from the Philippines, and uh, we got the Tagalog version of John 10.10, 10, and I always like to ground everything in the Word of God, so we remember that Jesus says, I came that they might have life and may have it more abundantly. And we can say that in Tagalog too, but I don't know the words. <laughs> so um, we talked about doing the tippy tap today, and sanitation is a big theme for farm stew. And that's one of the letters I like to highlight because it's not in any of our other health message teachings. So you probably haven't sat through a bunch of camp meeting messages on sanitation. But it's a really, really important principle. And I just want to hearken back to my grandmother for a brief moment. Uh, my grandparents, the ones that thought I was going to be sickly and stunted when I became a vegetarian, uh, she, uh, my grandma, they lived in actually farmland, Indiana. That was the name of the town, farmland. I'm not kidding. And as a kid, every summer, I'd go out from Colorado to Indiana. It was a two-day road trip. And I would get out there and peel ourselves out of the car that we drove in before the days of air conditioning, even in the car. And we'd jump out and go right to her garden. And uh, we spent a lot of time in her garden. They lived on a farm. My grandpa had about 80 acres. But he cropped in corn, beans, and wheat, corn, beans, and wheat. And then he let it go fallow that seventh year. And they weren't Adventists, but somehow I do believe he was thinking biblically. Although he was long gone when I realized about the Sabbath and wanted to ask him about those things. But um, one of the things that she was very, very adamant about was growing her own food, preserving it, which was all in the root cellar. And we used to snap beans and put them in jars and can them up. And many of you do that. And we encourage that for sure. Um, but one of the things she always said to me was, when I would be outside in the barn playing with the cats, which was my favorite thing to do, I'd come in the house and she'd say, did you wash your hands? <laughs> yes, Mama. And I don't know, how many of you had moms or grandmas that were big and said, did you wash your hands? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so that was an important thing that she knew she was loving me by making sure that I washed my hands. And it actually kind of drove me crazy as a kid. <laughs> Um, she also loved to cut our fingernails and file them. It was just like this little loving thing that she did for us. And she was also, the other little characteristic about her that I laugh now as an adult who, you know, cleans the bathroom in my house. But she would never let us, after we brushed our teeth, she would never let us spit in the sink. We had to spit in the toilet, which I thought was very strange. But it's actually really smart when you think about having to clean toothpaste off of the sink. But all that was related to sanitation, which I didn't know that big word back then. But, you know, we're talking about the medical system and how it's going to fail, or it's already failing for many of us. And we think about the overuse of antibiotics and how it's creating these superbugs and all this stuff. And all of that goes back to what my grandma practiced, which was sanitation, because they didn't think, oh yeah, you can just get sick and you'll just throw medicine at it. They had to prevent the illnesses in the first place and so that's what I want to share a little bit about what we're trying to do um, around the world but also with you here today and if you have your manuals uh, we're going to just be going quickly over lesson 22 which is sanitation and then the high point of this lesson is going to be going make a tippy top which I promised before but we're in the green section on page one and the lesson is called clean hands clean body clean house and, you know, we may not think that's so important, but really, the World Health Organization says that 80% of diseases, not chronic diseases, but acute diseases, can be prevented with clean hands. And we saw, even during this COVID craziness, you know, the put the masks on and, like, all these other diseases suddenly didn't exist. Now, we know that was all, a lot of it political, and who knows what to believe of any of it, but we know that... You know, part of that is just they were trying to keep people from touching their mouth and touching their nose and then putting it on their hands and then having their hands, you're shaking with others. And no matter how you feel about masks, I don't think any of us liked it, but there was a lot less of that touching going on during those terrible times. People were probably getting sick breathing their own <laughs> fumes, <laughs> but that's another story. Um, the, so the first question is why to be clean? And... Um, you know, when the people of Israel were 
taken out of Egypt and brought into the desert, God gave them very, very clear sanitation practices. And sometimes we forget about what an orderly God, God really is. And he said in Numbers, do not defile the land where you live and where I dwell, for I, the Lord, dwell among the Israelites. So God is not really feeling welcomed in a place where there's just messiness or uncleanliness. Um, he, he wants the land not to be defiled. And, and he actually specifically talks about human defecation even. I don't know if you know the verse in Leviticus where it's talking about when you have to defecate that you need to go bury it and cover it. Well, you know, we don't think about that because we all have running water and toilets, but like you said, we never know when that's going to stop. Just the basic practice of knowing that defecation has to be buried is a really important health habit that God made very, very clear in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Sanitation, a lack thereof, can lead to all sorts of things, as you might imagine. You know, fleas and parasites and bugs and who knows what else creepy crawly is going to get on you and in you. And then you can pass it to others very easily. And really the best remedy for all sanitation related diseases is clean water. And so we think about water for, you know, hydration, but we also need to think of it for cleanliness. So there's really, um, the, there's no better medicine than clean water. And often when I'm sharing this talk, I, I say, you know, when you, when you took a shower this morning, and most people in the developing world are pouring something over their head out of a cup or something, I said, did, did you pour coffee on your head? <laughs> and you're like, no. <laughs> did you pour Coca-Cola or, or some yellow or orange drink or pink drink? No, you know, everybody only puts water on their head, and that's a really important thing to do. So, you know, why are we putting all those colored drinks and toxic things inside if we want to clean the inside of our body as well? So that's just a simple, simple way to, to talk about drinking water and how important it is. If we believe in cleanliness on the outside, we want to be clean on the inside too. Of course, that does require... This is something I think we all know, but really, my grandma used to heat up the water and wash with hot water. Again, when you're not eating meat, your dangers are a little bit less and the temperatures you can kill the organisms are, are lower, so it's a little less critical. And a lot of us have dishwashers and that kind of thing that heats it up real hot. But um, yeah, I don't use them either, and so you really want to have it out in the fresh air and make sure these things are drying in a very cleanly way. So the clean house um, is really welcoming of Jesus, and I think that's something that we can aspire to, is like having a home that shows order, shows cleanliness, and shows that welcomeness to the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting, uh, the verses, if you look in Leviticus about where it's talking about that defecation verse that we talked about, it actually right before it says it's because God is holy, holy, holy. And so there's a connection between God's presence residing with a people and in a home and the cleanliness and order of that home. Now, you know, I've had kids, we all have a life, you know, we understand things happen. But, um, you know, clutter, it's, it's not only bad for your mental health, because it's just stressful, but it's also bad for your physical health, too. You can't keep it as clean, you're going to have dust, you're going to maybe have molds, who knows what. So really having that cleanly home, and then even the landscaping, like with plants and everything like that, I mean, they've done research that, you know, trees in a neighborhood, just having beautiful trees, it can actually increase the health status by, like, a whole class, economic class, because, um, you know, generally people of a higher class have better health, and just the trees can make that bump up mm -hmm. in and of itself. So when we think about, you know, where this place is right here, it's like, wow, there's no reason we can't have really healthy, <laughs> abundant lives surrounded by trees, but... Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, there may be a time soon where garbage collection doesn't happen. Um, and so this is just one of the standards in the international development. We, instead of having the trash just piled up somewhere where the rain is going to hit it and that water is going to go everywhere, really digging a hole and burying it. And burying it at least 20 to 100 meters from the home and at least 30 meters from any water source. 
And those are just basic principles to like keep you safe um, because you never know what's going to be leaching out of the trash. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge deal in a lot of countries you go to, you just see trash everywhere. And it's a, it's a basic principle that has actually been transforming a lot of communities where farm students are working because suddenly they're not covered in trash. George? How deep is that? Um, generally, I mean, it depends on the, the soil, how deep you can get, but just, it really doesn't need that much ground cover afterwards. Just, you know, you're going to fill it in and it's going to go up. So probably a meter or two down if you can get it down. If you're on rock, you know, you might need to dig, dig more of them, but more shallow. But it's an important principle and, you know, honestly, it's less than ideal, you know, hopefully you're not producing a lot of trash, but we do produce trash. That's reality, you know, so what to do with it. Sorry? Um, yeah, I, when you were talking about all this, this is kind of bringing back uh, to my life right now. Uh, we think about these things as being third world countries, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'm living here in Tennessee in kind of a third world condition because I have no running water. Like, like I mean, I have water, but I have no, um, I'm living in an RV that doesn't have any running water. Um, uh, the, I do my dishes outside, mm -hmm. so I don't have hot water. And I don't have a place to uh, build a fire right now. So what I've been doing is um, I use a very special hose that is uh, for um, drinkable, potable water. Mm -hmm. So not that I'm going to drink the water, but it's still, at least it, it's a hose. Uh, instead of using a garden hose, which can leach things into your water, mm -hmm. even if you're washing your dishes, I leave it out during the day so that the sun mm -hmm. will heat up the water. So I have hot water then for a while. And also, they sell those uh, black solar bags. So when I used to live off the grid, and, 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 and I don't have any now, but I hopefully will get some, you can use that for water washing. So if you don't have a source of heat, so there's always backup plans. I use the sun for a lot of things. And the same thing, like I have um, food, uh, and I've got a place to dispose, but I compost. I don't like mixing my, my compost, my, my edibles, you know, what I just ate with my regular garbage, because it just makes a complete mess, especially with the weather here. Mm -hmm. So I take my other garbage, they, they do have a dumpster, but I take my compost, and this is really important because uh, you need to get it away from your house too, the compost pile. Mm -hmm. Because like around here, there's snakes, and I don't know, there's like snakes here and different critters, I didn't, you know, armadillos. So I don't know where these animals are coming from. But you know, when you have a compost pile, you also have to make sure that that is away mm -hmm. from the house. And it's in the location because there's a lot of water here, and you get water runoff, and you have a compost pile that's downhill. So you have to, all, all these principles can really be applied to even living here. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are living you know, in the country and they don't have a home and they're living in the RV and they don't have running water. So these are, those are some of the things that I've been doing right now to kind of compensate for the lack of, you know, hot water and, you know, composting. So. That's an awesome point story. And it's funny because, you know, this farm to family, I, I'm quite serious about, I have, uh, several donors actually that are living in RVs and have been for a long time because they're trying to do country living and it you know it takes time to build a house between what you sell and buy and you know and so all these principles are really yeah. true and um, it can save people a lot of money here in that transition time too and and save lives frankly so that's great and we do have a section on compost somebody brought it up at lunch about that Caleb um, had come back and said we we're making soil and Nick when I was out there I was looking and um, so we can talk about the compost pile too because I think that's really important and I'm glad you said that because the rubbish in this pit should only be non biodegradable matter and we do want to keep it completely separate because anything biodegradable that's that's your new soil that's God's building blocks for your new soil and for your thriving abundant garden so um, lastly, just this is not a huge issue for here, but in many parts of the world, yeah, like acute respiratory illnesses are one of the leading cause of death. Is actually the leading cause of death for children. It's usually they're immunocompromised because of their diet already, but often it's exacerbated by cooking on wood stoves like this without that. So the rocket stove is something that um, I do have a video I was going to show you guys about making a rocket stove, and I'll. I'll do that actually right now if we're interested. It's very, very cool. But um, just to wrap up this part, the sanitation, that's your lung sanitation with smoking. I mean, it's really serious. You think you're, you're just breathing in a little smoke here and there, but you're basically cooking your lungs. And um, 
just to wrap up, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness. And we think about David, you know, and the sin in his life and basically the germs. <laughs> There's some commonality, you know. We need a clean heart. Um, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and renew a right spirit within me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and the sinners will convert to you. Amen. David. You didn't talk about pets in the home. Uh, I didn't. Did pets no longer have parasites? Ah, that's an interesting question and a hot debate. <laughs> well, the thing is, I've noticed growing up, when I was growing up, people didn't have animals in their homes, whereas today, they take them to the stores, they sleep with them and everything else. But the reason I mention this, um, our son went to a public, to a church school, and there was a kid there that was always sick. And we kind of noticed that he had all of these different types of animals in his bedroom, you know, snakes and, and all the lizards and so on. Mm. And we kind of look at that, that did these animals have something that caused him to be severely sick? Wow. You know, it's kind of interesting as we look back at that on, on his sickness. What, what is your concept of animals in the home and dealing with parasites and so on? You know, I would not say I'm an expert on that, but I thought it interesting that you said that this particular young man that was sick, he had like salamanders and turtles or something All like that. All kinds of animals. Yeah. He loved animals. Yeah. I mean, I have cats, so I'm not unbiased here because yes. <laughs> I'm crazy about my cat. But, um, yeah, I do think there's a serious danger, and I think the more exotic, the probably more dangerous, and we probably should less cohabitate with them. Um, I do know that there's some research that says, you know, it can kind of help your immune system with, like, dogs or cats or anything, but I'm not an expert on that one. Does George have an opinion? Not an opinion, but what they tell us now is you can walk in any major city in the U.S., and every parasite in the world is in the air. Oh, so wow. you don't have to go to a third country, third kind of country, to get all the parasites that are active in the cities. Okay, so George is saying any city in the U.S., I'm doing this really pretty, the, the parasites are there in the air, which I'm not surprised. So, a story? Yeah, um, and it's interesting you bring that up about the pets, because I'm a pet lover. I have Mario, and I love Mario, and I don't have him anymore, but he'd, he would sleep with me, and I love pets. I mean, we love pets, and but I do know a couple things. Um, cats, their litter boxes um, uh, are very dangerous. They carry, a, I think, a mycotoxin, mm -hmm. I believe, that's very um, dangerous to people, especially um, pregnant women. Yeah. So I know about that. And then also the spirit of prophecy. Alan White says we're not supposed to have pets in our homes. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I just read that not too long ago. And really, she actually addresses that and I don't remember if what uh, was in country living but she actually addresses pets wow so, yeah I know and I'm like no because <laughs> <laughs> so, we're all but it, it comes down to hygiene I think it was in, in, in the book hygiene councils on hygiene mm -hmm. but uh, you'll have to look that up yourselves and, and but um, yeah so yeah yeah well yeah and you can you can yeah that's but, a good uh, idea yeah, I think uh, it, it was it was part of her counsel, but yeah, I've lived with dogs all my life, and I'm not com I'm not counseling, just, but that's what she said. <laughs> Interesting. So. Well, I wanted to. Um, did anybody have any more comments on the sanitation? And then I was gonna um, play the rocket stove video that I have because I that came up earlier, and I thought I really wanted to share that with, as a good conclusion to this lesson. Searcher, but they actually have stood in bathrooms, public bathrooms, just you know, sitting there somehow watching people. I don't know how acting <laughs> casual or whatever, but there's research. <laughs> yeah, reading a book in the bathroom. And like, literally, it's less than 20% of people, Americans, are actually washing their hands properly at all. And so you think about, oh, you know, this is for elsewhere. No, it's actually for here too. And I think things have probably gotten maybe a little bit better since COVID started. People, maybe their awareness is a little bit more heightened. But we know how easy it is to take a habit, you know, get it in the right habit, and then lose it just as quickly as we got it, right? 
So the habit of hand washing is so critical. And one of the things to teach is just how to do it. And, you know, in Leviticus, um, before there was ever a microscope or there was ever any idea of like germ theory or microbes or anything, um, the Bible told us in Leviticus 15, 13, that you need to actually wash your hands with running water. Yeah. Now we know this, it's, it's something, you know, we have the privilege of a tap, but many places people just bring a bowl mm -hmm. and they just all put their hands in the bowl. And there's ways of, um, I don't know if you know the sparkly, like little sprinkle sparkly stuff that you can put for like little art projects for kids. Mm -hmm. There's a demonstration that you can do that's really fun where you cover your hands in the sparkly stuff and then um, show, dip it in the bowl while the sparkles go out in the water. And then the next person that comes in, they wash their hands in the same thing. They come out with all the sparkles wow. all over their hands. Wow. So I shoulda, coulda, woulda brought that. Um, it's a great way of demonstrating to people that, you know, the germs on your hands are automatically going to the next hands and the next and the next, however many people are sticking their hands in the same bowl. Whereas if you're doing it with the running water, it goes out. Um, one of the things we teach is that you should sing a little song while you're washing your hands. So I'm going to have everybody stretch out their hands and we're going to pretend that we're surgeons first of all so our hands don't just stop where the where this part of the skin is our hands go all the way up to here right because we can touch food with that so i'm thinking jesus loves me right how about that for a song so as you're singing look at the pictures you're getting water on you're getting soap and i just want to mention a lot of people in the world don't have enough money for soap or you don't want to use soap for some reason Wood ash has the same alkaline principle, and so you can actually scrub with wood ash. So we're going to sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong, they are weak and he is strong, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Okay, now you're rinsing, <laughs> shake, shake, shake it. Okay, so can you imagine what a witness, you're in the public restroom, and you're doing that, right? So there's a health message right there, it's free, you don't even have to have any literature on you, but you should hand them a little farm stew track, which by the way, we have many, um, and you have just basically prevented yourself from getting 80% of diseases and prevent yourself from passing them off to somebody else. That simple, right? So like we said last night, um, you know, this health message should not be cost prohibitive for anybody. And with wood ash, it literally costs nothing. Most of the places in the world, and many of our homes even, we have a wood stove or a wood something. And it doesn't have all the chemicals, especially if you get good wood, right? You don't want to use chemically treated wood and do that. But it's pretty powerful. Um, another thing is just the bath, of course. And I love these little kids taking a bath. <laughs> but, you know, especially in the, the heat of summer, um, you know, your skin is basically your external lungs. And you are breathing out toxins. All the time and so if you let them get reabsorbed back in your body you're just reabsorbing what your body's trying to get rid of and so taking regular baths is just so important I do get concerned because there's all these products now everybody has body wash everybody has this everybody has that I'm a big proponent of water and scrubbing <laughs> and um, yeah you use, you know you need to use something on your hair but I'm not convinced that all these other products are necessary or even helpful um, and then my grandma was right, <laughs> these clean cut nails. I want to tell a little funny story. I took my daughter on spring break a couple weeks ago and we decided to go have a girl's day at the spa. And I had no idea what spas cost these days, but um, we went and got our nails done. And we got those crazy, um, uh, I don't know what they're called, the, the dips or whatever. Anyway, it was these long nails and you couldn't get them off. 
and and it was like I just saw they got longer and I just saw the dirt under them and I couldn't get under them and clean and this is common and I hope I'm not offending anybody but it's like normal like in some circles if you're a woman and you don't have your nails done like that you know you're not really ladylike and I just was looking at them just appalled like I can't clean under my nails and I couldn't even clip them and I finally had to go get them professionally removed and I just oh thought goodness. never again so anyway I hope I didn't offend anybody but honestly when I think about nails I mean they really need to be kept short and one little thing if you think about traveling internationally and you try to figure out what to bring you know a lot of people go on little mission trips and they bring candy to the kids hopefully no Adventists do that but <laughs> I have often ordered a container of several hundred nail clippers and it's such a blessing because you can really just give one little thing, you know, you can give out 80 or they're a little bit heavy so you have to pack light. But um, the other alternative that people are using is razor blades and as you can imagine, it's, yeah, they just use raw razor blades and you can imagine, especially the little ones get cut and, and that leads to other things. So. This is a real beautiful gift and you, you know, not only just they get something happy, but it lasts for a long time and, and it will help their health and well-being. So, a little tip. <laughs> um, clean teeth, honestly, I think we all know this, but I was speaking with a dentist a few days ago, unfortunately, I had to go, and uh, found out that our enamel should last for 400 years. Wow. Yeah, he said he had done the calculations and it should last for 400 years. And so what is happening to us? Really, it's, it's quite bizarre. And one of the things that I love about Africa is they're so creative and they have these trees, um, neem trees, maybe you've heard of neem oil. They have these trees and they, you can cut a little stick of it and then they just peel back the bark and somehow it becomes quite fibrous and they use that for their toothbrush. So I don't know if there's some kind of antibacterial tree here that could be equivalent, but I wouldn't be surprised because God provides and yes. there's always some yeah. type of alternative like that. So it's an antibacterial little stick that they use for toothbrushes and it's they're just so creative, you know, I love it. So um, and then also just the coughing and the sneezing, you know, I don't know about you, but I grew up where you were taught to do that. And I think it's more recent, we're taught to do this, you know? It's actually really, really important, you know? And it should be part of our health talk. It's, it's part of loving others, you know? The second commandment is to love others. Well, if you love others, you're not coughing all over them. And of course, we've learned a lot about, you know, not going out when you're ill as well, which is just common courtesy and also good for your own healing if you, if you can do that well. Um, but then also the proper handling of food is so critical and you know a lot of people don't recognize food science like you hear about these E. coli scares well and often the ones that make the news happen to be from vegetables and I just want to say like vegetables don't have E. coli <laughs> it's from human handling right E. coli only comes from the gut and so if a vegetable is contaminated with E. coli, it's because a human handled it poorly. Mm. Unlike meats that have their own inherent dangers in and of themselves, and we know a lot about those as Adventists, and we can, we can make a good case for that. But um, I think really like the proper sanitation, when you think about it, it's almost even a justice issue because you have, say, migrant farm workers that don't have the opportunity to even take a bathroom break and do their thing in the field. That's how something happens. Or they don't, or they have latrines and they don't have a hand washing station right outside of it. So that's another reason to grow your own food and to have your own sanitation and hygiene in your home because those things can be dangerous and they can be widespread and they can kill a lot of people. I will say that over 80% of foodborne illnesses are from animal related foods. And so just by being vegetarian or vegan, you cut down your risk for foodborne illnesses dramatically. But you wouldn't necessarily hear that on the news because they always are talking about the lettuce with E. coli, right? Or the broccoli or whatever. But really we know 
um, from science that it's the foodborne illnesses are mostly from the animal products. But we got to be careful with everything. In Africa, where I was, when I first realized that, you know, we were doing these cooking classes and I bit into some greens and they were gritty. And I was like, huh. <laughs> I guess I recall, don't recall them washing them, you know? So when I first started talking about washing the vegetables, or cleaning the vegetables, I guess I said, um, they took the, the greens like that and they slapped it on their leg. <laughs> and that was going to get it clean. And I was like, oh, wow, we got a little more work to do here. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but you know, once again, how clean would I be if my water source was, you know, a mile or two away? Like, how much water would I pour over vegetables and then pour out on the ground? So I don't, I'm not here to judge, but you do want to be really careful. Um, and even restaurants and whatnot, you know, they're less and less training, less and less education that people have coming into the situation. So you're safer eating at home out of your own garden all the time. Um, and then just washing dishes. Um, and then I do want to show the tippy tap video also. And then we'll go over and make hopefully two of them, I think. Right, Krista? Yeah. So, um, all right. So this is, this is kind of fun. I'll just give a brief explanation. Uh-oh, I do hope we have mine. Um, so this is a Wyatt. He's a volunteer with us in Malawi right now, just FYI. And um, he, I, I actually took the video footage during a training in South Sudan. We had seven different countries uh, represented there. And um, somebody did ask me, how are we having all this staff? And I just want to say it is by generous donations that I'm able to, through Farms, to be a conduit for God's blessings and support these people in their work. So you'll see Daniel, who is the country director in Uganda teaching all these people in South Sudan and it's really a privilege to get to have this information shared with people. So this is Wyatt. My name is Wyatt Johnson. Welcome to this farm stew training video. We're going to learn how to make a farm stew rocket stove that is fuel efficient and burns up smoke and redirects that smoke. We place a lot of importance on rocket stoves now in the sanitation module because of the health hazard that smoke has had, especially in women and children. So the smoke coming out of fires often goes deep into the Oops. I think I did something. <laughs> lungs and like the walls of a cooking shack that are black, it makes the walls of the lungs black in both the women and children around that fire. We want to find a way to make cooking more efficient, to save money, less wood, less charcoal, and to redirect and burn up that smoke so it doesn't go into the lungs of the people we care about. So in Juba, South Sudan, our farm stew teams had a conference and a training where they built a model rocket stove. And I want to walk you through that just briefly here over the next few minutes. Let's see how they did it. To get started, one of the first things we need to do is to collect termite mound soil. The soil from these mounds is sticky and almost thicker than clay. And mixed with water and some of the other ingredients we're going to use, it makes a style of cement and is perfect for making rocket stoves. This termite soil, it needs to be pounded. It'll stick in large clods together. However, to make it into that smooth, muddy cement, we need to break it down. So use sticks, hose, and shovels to pound that soil into a powder. After that, begin preparing thatch or grass or hay. Use any kind of dried organic matter. This is going to help bind that muddy termite soil cement together. This is together exactly how the Israelites made bricks in brick Israel too. Mm -hmm. Here we see some of the training participants getting the soil ready. So here they have a mound of the termite soil mixed with some regular soil at about 50%. And they're slowly mixing it together. However, soon they're going to be mixing it together with their feet. This is a fun exercise and everyone can participate. So take your shoes off, take your socks off, roll up your pants. That is a guy, a Dinka from South Sudan. It's his tribe. They're very now that tall. We have our mud repaired. 
let's talk about dimensions. This stove will be 60 centimeters wide by 100 centimeters long and 60 centimeters in height. All of these dimensions are from outside to outside. As we're looking at the inside of the rocket stove, in the middle is a passing chamber for heat and air. This passing chamber can be created by making a bridge with a few bricks and then overlaying with mud. It can also be made using sticks. Now, if you are using sticks, keep in mind when a fire is going, those sticks will burn. So, if using sticks, use plenty of mud in place of those bricks that would make that bridge. The mud will stand if it is made correctly and it is strong. Continue to plaster your rocket stove until you can't see any brick. And remember, the more plaster you add, the better insulation your oven will have. Let's see what the next directions are from Daniel Dupanda. Potato leaves, are you seeing? They were potato leaves, but now if I just show you like this, you may not know. Take your crushed sweet potato leaves and put them into a bucket of water and make a really thick green slurry. The more sweet potato leaves you have, the better. Now take your sweet potato leaf slurry and liberally apply it to your mud cooking stove. Use your hands to work it into all the different cracks and edges. You want your stove to look nice and smooth, and this sweet potato slurry is going to help you do that. With this curing process with the sweet potatoes, it acts as a crack preventer, and it helps protect that termite cement that you made. You will do this once a day for three days. As you're molding the rocket stove, make sure to put a circular ventilation shaft at the bottom left side of the rocket stove. This will help smoke escape not out of the stove tops, but out of the side, away from the person cooking. Thank you for joining us for this training video. When you're making your rocket stove, send us feedback, videos, photos. We want to see what you're doing. We hope this will bless you, your family, and your entire community. So that's our rocket stove. Hey, my. And um, we'll probably we're gonna make one in Florida. We didn't have time today because we just had this one little chunk of a day, but uh, we'll make one in the training in Florida. We're gonna be gathering for three days right before ASI National, just an hour south of Orlando. We did that last year. Chris and went, so we're gonna be excited. And I think Chris and his crew are coming. So. We do have a presentation on how to make a rocket stove here on the 26th of June. Oh, really? It's scheduled. Oh, okay. that's awesome. It's been scheduled four times, but it's scheduled. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see if we see how they do it different if they do it. That was wonderful. But that is a good. That's my first introduction to that's wonderful. what a rocket stove is. Yeah, I was really excited. The guy, Daniel, in the blue shirt, he uh, is actually a graduate of Bogama University, and he studied what we would call international development, but they just call it development because they're in the country that needs development. So he had a whole class in appropriate technology. And uh, I was thinking before that, you know, we weren't at the place where we could afford to start teaching these stoves, but it's been wearing on my heart because we do the cooking classes and you're always like, your eyes are burning and it's just kind of miserable. And then when he came up with that termite mound thing, and there's termite mounds all over the place, I'm not sure what you could use here if there's something you could use in place, but honestly, we could probably afford a little bit of concrete and that's what it would, you know, take and substitute. We have red clay everywhere. It would probably be a suffice, yeah. That will be interesting if you can do it. Yes? This display took us a couple hours, but we had, you know, everything together and everything. But, like, they were, you know, going and getting the grasses and going and getting the mud and everything like that. So it, it took some time. But, uh, yeah, and they even just the, the wire mesh, I mean, that was something they just found on the church headquarters. We were actually at the church headquarters in, in South Sudan, in the city of Juba. And, um, yeah, it was really exciting because I actually didn't know. I mean, I've seen them before, but I hadn't been part of the process before. And um, it was just really cool to see everybody coming alive. And, and the sweet potato leaf thing, I did not know that. And I was like, what are they going to do with the sweet potato leaves? 
And yeah, it was like this very um, just slimy slurry kind of thing. And apparently, yeah, it makes the concrete not crack at all and strengthens it. It's almost like a glaze. It is. It's like a glaze, exactly. Yeah. God's glaze. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I saw sweet potatoes over in your garden over there. So. so it takes three days to glaze it. How long does it cure? Does it take a week or something of burning it? I mean, it really just depends on how intense the sun is. You, they do encourage you to make these not in the direct sunlight as much as possible, you know, like maybe on the north side of the house or something like that, because I think it just, the sun is so intense in those places. Nobody wants to cook in the sun anyway. <laughs> So, yeah, but honestly, that, that smoke breathing, I mean, when I realized how inefficient, I mean, how efficiently and inexpensively we could do this, it's like, okay, we got to have all of our teams everywhere be training on these, because the alternative is just three rocks, and they just are constantly feeding it fire. Um, another thing that's in here is we call it a fireless cooker, and that's another thing that we do to prevent uh, the, the use of firewood and reduce the smoke inhalation and basically all that is is some type of thermal capture of heat and I'm trying to find Chris do you think you could try to find the page the fireless cookers on actually I just found it yay um, page 11 in the green it's right after the rocket stove which we just have a very short paragraph about rocket stoves there and a picture of it but on page 11 in the green, the fireless cooker, that's something that I did when I first got over there in 2015. I had learned about it from another woman who had gone and done trainings and cooking classes in Africa. It's basically like you're building a gigantic bird's nest. And it's just with any dried plant material pushed into any container that's the size of a, a pot where there's like a hole for the eggs that would be the size of the pot. And one thing they really want to encourage is like, the thicker the pot that you cook with, the more thermal heat it's gonna retain. And what's really amazing is a lot of these women and countries and you know us here too, like if we didn't have power, we would have to be just standing by the stove, making, keeping the food hot, keeping the food, and you're always putting wood in, which often they're walking for hours for wood too. Um, with this, they can put it in this container they cover it, put like some type of cloth or something so that no dirt or anything gets in from the plant matter. And then you can even put it in the sun if the sun is out. And that'll keep the food cooking for several hours and hot for several more hours. And so suddenly you've just freed up hours and hours in somebody's day. I mean, that's a real blessing to people. And you can see them putting it in there on the bottom of page 11. And then there's something on the bottom of page 12 there called the Wonder Bag. And that's a group, speaking of enterprise, you talked about what are enterprises. Um, that's just a sort of commercialized version of the fireless cooker. And so that's something to think about even here, you know. How do people keep their food warm? You know, as, as energy gets more scarce or more expensive or whatever, um, putting your food in something like that to keep it warm is, would work well. What's your philosophy about raw food? Well, as a nutritionist, I'll say this. Um, I believe that, you know, there's a lot of foods that are well consumed raw, and, you know, a lot of foods that, where by cooking it is doing some destruction to the micronutrients or phytochemicals. Um, but then there's other foods that really do need to be cooked. And I know like people, sometimes when they get on a health kick and hang out with us Adventists, like they go for say green, green smoothies and they get on this whole green smoothie kick, right? Which there's a lot of good things in a green smoothie, but there's also things that are, can be damaging. For example, my father went on a green smoothie kick and ended up with the most horrible case of kidney stones ever. Um, because what is the acid? Oxalate. Oh, oxalates, thank you. Yeah, so like certain leafy grains that should be chewed, um, and, and you know, there's, what is it, amylase? In yeah, amylase is yeah. the first. So like there's all these enzymes in your body that when you're chewing, you're activating the breakdown of certain chemicals, but when you're just swallowing, it just passes right by, and so you don't do any of that breakdown. And cooking does the same thing. So 
I mean, I'm not against eating raw dark leafy greens, but in high quantities, you're going to give your kidneys problems and you're going to get kidney stones. And I actually, I always try to give that warning to people because, you know, honestly, my dad thought he was going to die from these things. And it's not uncommon. The oxalates are very serious. So I think, you know, the whole sort of moderation in, in yeah. things and, you know, is our temperance message, you know, moderation in good things, total abstinence from things that are harmful, I think is a good summary of our temperance message. So, yeah. I was just going to, when you're talking about the, the alternative ways of cooking, um, we, uh, um, I went to a medical missionary, uh, um, it's like a group like this, and this is the first time I've seen somebody made a homemade hot box, they're called hot boxes. Okay. So uh, there is actually a blueprint to do these hot boxes, and it's very easy. You made with thick styrofoam, and uh, her husband put, you know, like paneling and stuff around it. But it's the same concept for what they're doing in, in these other countries. Mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, propane. We don't have propane. We don't have electricity. And put them out in the sun, and and they work. Mm -hmm. And they can actually boil water. That they're they they work that well. Mm -hmm. And um, then the other thing that I was going to add. Let's see. You talked about oh the rocket stove. So. Um, Instead of doing, there's also a portable rocket stove that you can make with a number 10 can and a soup can. And all you need is tin snips, and they work very well. So, and the same thing, there's no smoke, and, and we made those too when we lived off the grid. And they're, they're just really nice to have an alternative way of cooking. So, if you don't have the red clay, like in Wisconsin when we made ours, we didn't have red clay, we didn't have any of that stuff. We wanted something portable, and we just got a number 10 can and snipped it out and put another can in there, and it works. It works. So, yeah, there's a lot of models for rocket oh, yes. stove, and so this one, we chose one where they basically wouldn't have to purchase anything. Yeah. The the metal crate that held, you know, under the pan, they had to find that somehow. But yeah, we we try to do things in farm stew that assume that people have like basically no disposable income whatsoever. So, yeah. All right. Well, speaking of that, let's move to the tippy tap, and uh, I just want to mention, let's see, what page is it on? I, I had it pulled up, but I think I pulled my... Page four. Page four of sanitation, which is green. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, so building your own tippy tap. This is something, I think, even if you're just going camping or anything, like it's something you should just do. And I know the Sunday gentleman is going to be our survival guy, so he'll, he'll probably have other ideas for this. But this tippy top has really changed the lives of a lot of people around the world because it suddenly gives them running water. And um, so I'm going to play the video um, if you guys want, and then we'll have Carissa, who is all prepped and ready to roll, with supplies and we're gonna try to make two of them and we'll have to work together to accomplish this task okay and this one is a little bit longer but I think it's worth it so hey my name is Wyatt with farm stew and today we're gonna to be building tippy taps out of the module 5 farm stew recipe manual so let's get started First thing what we're gonna do is we're gonna get three sticks. This is gonna be an in-ground tippy tap. So there are mobile tippy taps that you can move around. Or these will be stuck in place with these two sticks into the ground. So here we're at Heart Village in Florida and we grab, they have a lot of bamboo. So we're gonna be using bamboo for this. However, wherever you are throughout the world, you could use sticks of any caliber. So these are kind of thinner. Usually we prefer them to actually be Bigger. It's a little more sturdy, a little bit stronger. And so I'm actually going to also pound these in the ground because if you look, we're in some nice, really soft sand. So it's nice and easy to dig it down. So what I'm going to do is use a custom made mallet. You can't find this at Home Depot. We're going to take this and we're going to start pounding it in the ground. Now, if you're somewhere else, we also you can also use a shovel to dig down. You can use gravel to help support it. It just depends on what's needed in your environment and in your village and community. I want to sink this at least, I would say, one foot into the ground. This needs to be nice and stable. We're going to be holding about 
a half a liter or two liters of water in a container at a time. So it needs to be able to support that and it rocking back and forth. So now we're going to look at the distance between the two sticks that we're going to put here. I would say make it about one meter apart. You want, you want it to be wide enough where you can fit your whole body in, but not too narrow because that might make it difficult to use. So let's go for one meter. You can play around with the size and see what you like as you're making these. make our cross section or horizontal piece so we're going to attach this right here right behind these and where it sits we don't have a Y a branch that has a Y in it you would usually rest that in right here however because we don't have that we're going to use some twine rope string vines whatever you have to tie around it what you want to do is start by taking a length of rope about two meters long and folding it in half. So you've got a loop, a bite of rope here. Then you want to come around and take about half a meter or a foot and a half of this length of rope. And you want to just begin crisscrossing this back and forth. So you bring your loop and you start with doing a simple crisscross and then we'll come around and come back down, crisscrossing the opposite way. And what this will create is a locking bite. Now you bring it back around and you loop down so you have just a small loop remaining. Then you feed both ends of the rope through and you snug this back and around until that is very tight. Now with these loose ends, you want to come down and then just snug in between the vertical piece and the horizontal piece once or twice more. I think that should be good. And then you separate your rope, bring it on top, and you want to just tie a very simple square knot to start. And that is an easy one to hold your position. You snug that down. And to make sure it doesn't loosen, you put a finger on top. Then you tie another square knot, which is a little tricky with one hand, um, but not too bad. So then you want to just have someone help you by holding this rope. And then you just tighten it down like that. And that creates a self-locking bond so that the harder you push down, the tighter the knot becomes. So that's another method to creating tippy tap when you only have straight sticks without a V in top to rest the horizontal stick. As you're making this, you want to make sure that your stick in the middle is horizontal. Let's see if this is horizontal because what's going to happen is there's going to be a string attaching a jug of water. And we don't want that string to be sliding back and forth between the two. So mine looks pretty good. In fact, I do want to lower this side just a little bit. Let's get our jug and start getting that ready. So right off to the side here, I have an old bleach jug. What I want to do is get this nice and washed out. You don't have to use uh, something meant for water. This is for washing hands, but we do need it to be clean. So this gallon of bleach or this however large amount of volume with this bleach was, it was washed out. We don't want to be putting bleach onto our hands. You can do the same with detergents with things for used previously used for cooking oil or anything else. You may want to be careful with things that would be damaging, like carcinogens, like motor oils, and other cancerous items. Beware of using those. We're going to take our jug. We're going to tie around a three-foot piece of rope, a little string of rope or vine, around the handle like so. so I'm going to put this in here. Now, if you want to watch what I'm doing here, I've doubled the rope. I'm just going to pass it through and let it catch right there. Now, we're going to take that and we're going to tie it of our stick that's going. 
for the forest not to leave. Now that that's done, what we're going to do now is puncture our holes into our jug. It makes sense to do before you hang it, actually. Here, we have a lighter. However, you may have matches where you are, uh, or a campfire, or just a fire pit in general. You need a source of heat is recommended, but not necessary. We're going to want to use a rounded tip to poke into this bottle, like let's say a nail or a sharp pen. For here, we only had a screwdriver. This is a Phillips screwdriver. It's pretty dull, but when we heat this up, it should be able to puncture, and it's got rivets, we should be able to move it around. However, wouldn't recommend using this. A nail would be much better. We're gonna make the first puncture. This is gonna allow air to escape when we're tipping this over, the tippy tap. We're gonna make that first puncture up right about here. I'm going to heat this up. Let's make our puncture. Okay, now that we got our air hole in, we're going to make the second hole. This time it's going to be for the water that's going to come out and come onto our hand. So we're making the second hole. We want to make sure it's going to be towards the side. So what's going to be happening is we're going to connect a string right here that's going to bring it down. We're going to have a foot pedal. We're going to build that in a second. We want that hole to be off the side. Otherwise, we're going to be dribbling water all of our feet. You'll see what I'm talking about in a second. So let's make this second hole. So not only did I make it off to the side so that our feet won't be dribbled on by the water coming out, but I also made it low and towards the end because this is going to be tipped up. If you watch the water come out right now, it's going to be tipped up. The water is going to come pouring out. So next, let's get the string. Let's tie some string around here and get our foot pedal set up. Let's attach our string to the lid. I'm going to, so some bottles, this may or may not work. Our concern is that this lid might pop off, but since this is a pretty well locking lid, we're going to, it's okay to put it around the spout here. If need be, you can also put it around the handle right here. But for now, we're going to put it around the lid. After tying it to our lid, we're going to bring it down to our foot pedal. I would say make your foot pedal about at least a half meter long. Uh, any shorter, it probably won't be as effective and you're just gonna get a lot of water on your feet. Having a little bit longer is not bad. I would say err on the side of it being longer. I'm gonna be feeding through the, the twine or rope through this uh, little soap dispenser here. I think I found the old There we go. Now that I have my rope fed through, we're going to attach it to our tippy tap. If you have soap, you want to poke a whole, couple holes in the bottom, too. <laughs> and the location in which you attach it could vary, but for right now, we're just going to attach it right here. And you'll notice on this tippy tap we built, there's all kinds of twine loose. If you look right here, look at all of this. Look at this stuff right here. Ideally, you want to cut this off. It's loose and get in the way. It can easily be pulled and untied. Right now, we're just leaving it and we're just making a model. We're going to stick our soap here inside our little soap holder. How convenient. 
All right, now what do you want to do? Get your hands, I'm gonna model how we want to do this. Let's get our hands wet with our brand new tippy tap. Get some soap, soap up. What is that, 20 seconds of washing, I believe. Get under the nails, in between the hands, all around the back side of the hands. Just making sure I get all underneath the nails. Once I'm all soaked up, I can pour some water out. And let's get my hands nice and clean. Get this detergent and soap off. Maybe you want to attach a towel to your tippy tap. That's up to you. We don't have one for today, but it might be a nice accessory to have. So this is a tippy tap. It's a handless washing station. It's super cheap to make. You could find these resources in the jungle, in the forest, all around you, wherever you are. And all you need are just a few supplies and a little bit of creativity. So thank you for joining us as we learn how to make this. And I look forward to seeing other people use this across the world with the potential it has. Amen. All right. Okay, so I think there was like two people that knew what a tippy tap was before, and now hopefully all of you do. But the real learning is in the doing. So I think it's time we take a little break moment and um, head on over to the latrines where we want them before Sabbath so we can be holy, holy, holy tomorrow. <laughs> and we'll get going, and Chris will be our guide.